Okay, uh, our next talk is NixX IPFS by John Erickson. And the topic of it is that IPFS is a natural way to distribute data for Nix because of their shared focus on immutability, content addressing, and decentralization. John and the team at Obsidian Systems have spent the past several months integrating the two, and he's pretty excited to present what he's been working on and what can come next. And a little background for this talk is that um, John has been using Nix since the summer of 2014, and he also um, heard of IPFS that very same summer and imagined them being integrated together. And he's been using Nix at work since joining Obsidian in 2017. Okay, John, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, World of Peace. Um, wonderful introduction, and I am indeed quite excited to be here. Um, in fact, I made far too many slides for my 10-minute slot, so buckle up. We're just going to try to get through them all. Um, and um, so that means I did have to narrow the scope. I'd love to talk about both why we're doing this and how we're doing this, but I'm going to focus on the how today um, with the idea that not that many people actually contribute to Nix itself versus, say, Nix packages or other projects which are best in class for outside contributors. Um, so hopefully that's still interesting, and hopefully um, seeing the technical details, you all can put together the big picture of why I think this is so important. Um, yeah, and without further ado, let's go. So Nix and IPFS. Um, first of all, what is IPFS? I'm sure many of you don't know. Um, to me, the, as a user, it's really quite simple. You can put data in and get a hash out. You can put a hash in and get data out. And IPFS understands references to other data within that data. So here I have sort of a compound object. And in the second case, I'm indexing to get this thing within the high field. And there's my original object with its original hash from before. Um, this type of reference is called an IPLD link. Uh, the data model for IPFS is called IPLD, hence IPLD link. And it has this sort of big 10 approach of there's other content addressing ways out there. Let's try to support them all and get as many people on this IPFS bandwagon. Um, and important for us, those other approaches include gits. Um, and really, as a user, I think that's all you need to know. Um, it's really ironclad. You know, with, due to network issues and other things, you may not get the right response. Uh, you may not get a response back, but you'll never get the wrong response. So putting and getting, that's really all there is to it. Um, Next, let's go inside Nix. Um, Nix has an architecture, something like this. There's some utils at the bottom. There's some new stuff like flakes on the top. Um, but sort of three core libraries are the store, the fetchers, where all the built-ins fetch this fetch data is implemented, and where the expression language is implemented. Um, today, we're going to mainly talk about the store, the heart of the beast, and also a little bit, tiny bit about the fetchers. Um, so first, some data types in the store. We have the store path. I'm sure this all looks familiar to you all. There's the name part. There's the hash part, which is really quite a mess. And actually, we don't store the store there. We get it from the store that um, we also have a reference to internally. Um, the store paths can be made two ways. They can be input address, when, in which case we're... Um, we are um, hashing, uh, sorry. The input address means this inscrutable bit becomes from how we are designed to make the path versus constant addressed comes from how we are, um, the, what the data is itself. Um, and the reason I call it inscrutable is if you have a provenance, you can check if a store path matches it and verify the provenance, but there's no way to invert the hashing functions and derive the provenance from a store path. Store path really is a quite a bit of a black box. Um, oh, it looks like I have more time so I can slow down a bit. Next up is uh, the derivation. Um, 
these are the nodes in the dependency graph. Um, I have a fake dependency graph here. Um, they have fields like the outputs. These are the paths produced. The builder, which is the command that um, ultimately is going to be run to do the work. Input sources, which will be used by this build step and other input derivations. So previous build steps whose outputs we want to use as inputs to this build step. Um, this is probably the most, I this is probably the most important data structure that what Nix does. Um, you know, many other things, store files, like with I talked about the store path, but the idea of this broken up into steps, which I run in sandboxing um, way of doing a build plan. That's quite unique to Nix. Um, so definitely keep the derivation in mind. Um, outputs, which I mentioned before, were previously represented with a struct like this. Um, we have the path being produced and the house shall go on the hash for fixed outputs. But you'll notice these are strings. That's not really good type. I don't like strings. I hope you don't like strings. So yeah, um, just to have a nice workbench to add these new features, um, I wanted to clean this stuff up. So we did. And now it's something more like this. We have an explicit optional here indicating that actually those strings can be empty. And um, a struct that looks something like this um, with the hash now having a hash type and the method for how that hash was made. Um, one thing interesting to keep in mind is this corresponds to the type of derivations we have. You should be familiar with at least the ones we have currently today, which is the input address derivations and the fixed output derivations. Um, so one ramification here is while fixed outputs are only um, allowed to have one output and also the purity versus impurity choice must be made derivation wide. Um, the, some of the other stuff could actually be decided on a per output basis if we wanted to. We just haven't done that yet. Um, you'll see there's this other file ingested method type I sort of glossed over. Previously, there were just these bool recursives that indicated whether to use NAR or just have a single file hashed atomically. Um, now that's also been replaced with this file ingestion method that makes those two options clearer. Um, and likewise, where it was a, a field um, outside the derivation output struct, it was usually called just recursive bool, and now it's called method um, to you know, put flat and NAR on equal footing. We should probably rename recursive to NAR yet, but clean up for another day. Um, and lastly, there's a valid path info. Um, in a local store, so on your machine, this would correspond to a row in the SQLite table. Um, in a binary cache, the types we have today, the HTTP-based ones, this corresponds to the NAR info file that um, is the first thing Nix will look up. And again, there's this string type here for CA, what's CA, what's the string, not really clear. That's more clear. Again, it's optional, the string can be empty and the CA is a content address. Um, this again corresponds to those input address versus content address fields. Um, if you have a content address one, it will have a hash. Um, and that's what this is along with what how the hash was made, just like one of those file ingestion methods and also something for the way derivations are hashed. Um, I should also talk about the other stuff here. So there's a path itself. This is really this is the primary key and this is sort of the other metadata for that path. So I probably actually want to split this out um, to separate the keys and the values. Um, uh, we have the NAR hash because even if you have another hash today, Nix always wants to also have its native way of verifying data, the NAR hash. Um, 
and we have the references, which are the other store paths that um, this path may refer to. Um, so yeah, those all these structs we've gone over so far are the real the core building blocks of how LibStore is put together. Um, I guess the last, um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's the stores themselves and the very big interface there, but I'm just trying to go over data, not interfaces. Um, if you're the type of person that thinks they're different, unlike C++. Okay, um, so the first thing, now we get into the new features we have. The first is a floating um, content address derivations. Um, I'm gonna be really fast here because actually Regnet, the person who wrote the RFC for this did a lightning talk. So scroll back about an hour or so in the live stream. Um, or once it's chopped into talks and you can hear more about that there. Um, really quick, today we have the regular input address derivations and the fixed output ones. There's different trade-offs. One makes input address outputs, the other makes content address. One works purely, one works impurely. One has floating content, which I picked the word floating because it's sort of the opposite of fixed, which is to say that until you build the derivation, you're not quite sure what you'll get. The other is fixed because we have that hash written down. Only one thing's allowed to be produced. Um, for at least the IPFS purposes and not the other benefits of CA, all you need to know is that we have a third type which combines the aspects of these. It's pure, it's floating, it can produce anything you want, um, but the output is still constant addressed. Um, and so the short story is this should be purely better than the input address by sort of getting stuff from each and being the best of both worlds. Um, though you will probably want fixed output ones for those impure things. Um, making the new ones impure would not be the best of both worlds. Um, and going back to our struct derivation output, now um, rather than just using the optional uh, file hash, um, to indicate the two types, we have all three. Um, this is a sum type, um, or what the rest is known as the enum. Uh, never mind the wrapping struct, never mind all the names, but every type of derivation corresponds to a type of output, and they are, have or don't have information like a fixed hash, a way of hashing, or a pre computed path based on um, whether that fits this uh, feature breakdown. Um, so I've talked about what this is. I haven't talked about why we need it for IPFS. Um, answer is pretty simple. More content addressing is better for IPFS. Um, I want us to be able to do arbitrary uh, work index as we do today, but have all the intermediate results content addressed um, for um, better interoperability with IPFS. And that's exactly what derivations, um, fluency CA derivations give us. Um, the next feature is git hashing. Um, in case you follow how git works, this is tree and blob hashing, um, how the files and directories are hashed, not commit hashing, um, since nothing in Nix's data, data model worries about actually storing commits and storing history. Um, so implementing this after those previous refactors was Pretty simple how the what the change in the types. We just add a new variant to this file and gesture method and fix all the errors. Um, so the benefits of this is before um, is is first that our fixed output derivations no longer have need to have this SHA-256 that's totally unique to Nix and meaningless to everyone else. Um, you can actually get the tree hash that um, one could use directly from Git and put that in your derivation. So again, trying to interoperate with the rest of the world a bit better. Um, also the, the built-in fetchers, we've also given them support so they can um, work not just fixed output derivations. Um, and finally, like I mentioned before, IPFS supports Git hashing out of the box. Um, so this means that we can go from store paths made Content address store paths on the Nix side made with the Git and IPFS references are one to one. We can we don't need to know what the data is. We can just convert the reference itself, um, and this means 
the whole process is trustless, which is really good. Um, the next feature is content address-based queries. Um, the idea, like I mentioned before, the store path is opaque, and this isn't so good when you want to query something that doesn't know about Nix, doesn't know about store paths, because um, it can't really do anything with an opaque query key like a store path. So we made this new type, store path descriptor, which has a name, has the constant address, and has the references. Um, and this, just to be clear, is exactly the uh, pre-image of how a uh, CA store path is computed. So this is now the provenance reified, and this is something you could verify a store path with. Um, and also on the valid path info side, um, something the store is supposed to provide back. Um, oh, I actually messed up my slides. This field is supposed to be gone because we now have collapsed the NAR hash and the CA into this, these data structure um, where these is a Haskell idiom I rewrote in C++ or we did actually, um, coworker and I, where you have one, you have the other, you have both. So the idea here is Nix no longer is so attached to its NAR hash way of verifying data. And instead, just any sort of hash will do as long as there's a week, at least one. Um, you can still have both. So there's no loss of information. But um, Nix can make do if you just have the constant address one from which the path is derived and not also this additional NAR hash. Um, so putting... So using these new types, we can change the store interface, um, which I won't get into the exact methods, but I will describe what this abstractly looks like. Before, we were always querying with store paths. And if we were trying to query about um, a path, we always got path info with the NAR hash. Now you can query with the store path or the descriptor, and the info only needs to have at least one hash, not both. Um, and what this means is we can use IPFS as a substitutor or binary cache. And there's no extra metadata, extra trust, extra signatures. Um, you don't need any of that. If you just want content address data, you just get content address data. There's nothing to set up or worry about. Um, so this is a big usability improvement, especially if we want to distribute source code versus binaries over IPFS, um, which I do. And um, so the next feature, um, this is so far we've been kind of getting the kind of core stuff for working with um, existing like get data and um, IPFS. Now we'll get into sort of the more IPFS specific improvements. Um, so if you remember from before, store paths can have references, um, but references are very much uh, Nick's note, uh, Nick's. Um, a Nix concept, get data model doesn't have any sort of store references notion. So if we want to do arbitrary data in Git, um, we can't just use Git, uh, um, Git's tree and blob hashes out of blocks, but need to add this other information in. So we made this Git with references convention. Um, I have what's probably a really blurry example for you all here, but we can just go over the highlights. Um, this right here is an IPFS link for the actual file data hashed normal gateway. Um, next, we have the name. Um, and we need the name um, for any self-references. Um, so we're using Nix's existing ability to zero out the self-references, but we need to fill them back in. So we need the name for that. Um, and the references themselves, rather than being store paths, are IPFS links to uh, other data with metadata that's encoded the same way. So the reference graph is now an IPLD graph of everything we need. Um, and the last feature is IPLD derivations. Um, if you have a derivation that kind of uses all the new stuff, it's floating content address, its input sources are only Git with or without the rest as just described. And the input derivations are only such other derivations. So it follows these rules all the way down. We can convert that derivation and its dependencies to IPLD. Um, get a blurry example, but 
we've got the links to the input theories, links to the sources. And so that's it. The whole graph natively represented in IPFS in a very, I think, intuitive way. Um, I hope you do too. Um, last feature, which we didn't do, is storing the map from the outputs to the hashes in IPFS. Um, so again, basically at time. So uh, this is because the one there's one trustful part still left, which is when we have builds that we don't know what they'll produce, there's no way to verify that other than doing the build. So if you're going to use any mapping at all, any sort of cache, you have to trust the cache. Um, and now we can put this all together. So with all the stuff, all the changes we've made, we can have all data constant address, be it sources, build artifacts, or the build plans. That's the derivation graph, the last implemented feature I talked about. Uh, we can use the same constant addresses end to end, whether in IPFS or Git, um, because the the way we wrap them and the way we did IPLDs, um, uh, so the way the way we wrap them with the Git references, uh, we can still convert that to a likewise um, calculated Nix path. Um, all just obtaining the data, never mind why, is completely trustless because it's the same constant addressing moved throughout, and only this last bit, the mapping from derivations and outputs to the hash of the data actually produced um, is trustful. And that's OK, because that is inherently trustful. You're trusting another binary cache to um, say what the data is um, and trusting what it purports to be. Um, OK, so still pretty quick, but that's my last slide. Um, ready for any questions. Um, hope that made some sense. Yep, yep. We are into the Q&A portion now, and I will read you off the first question. So this is from another speaker we had yesterday. Is it feasible that IPFS support the Nix packages scale at some point? How much time do you think it will take to reach this level of maturity? I hope that made sense. Some part of that seemed a little bit disjointed to me. Um, I, I certainly hope so. I, I think the question's a bit vague for me to really like, like okay we like, can move to the next one okay yeah, so um, what does ca derivations with contents floating mean um so the ca is constant address which refers to that the output paths are constant addressed not input addressed um so the the type of store path you get um the floating refers to that there is no fixed hash and like a normal derivation it can produce anything um it it does so um, that's why it's pure um and then it's a derivation because it's a derivation i think that's all the words in the jargon um yep it seems there's intersection a couple concepts like floating point numbers and like ca certificates oh boy i didn't even think yeah it's, it's nothing to do with either of those um right right i because content addressed in those are like almost the same oh yeah well, we're gonna have to get rid of all the ca and go back to content addressing so no one thinks certificate authority good point right, right. <laughs> okay next one is is there hash type whitelisting uh say that again is there hash type whitelisting i have no idea what that means okay I will look in the channel if there's any other questions like people um clarified, like after hearing this, like they want to elaborate or something. Hopefully, I think the stream might be for like 10 seconds behind for some people. Okay. Okay, I do not see anyone elaborating. Oh, I do see someone typing. Okay, I had Nick ask, what do you mean by hash type whitelisting? And I see... um. Someone saying, if you're only storing git tree slash blobs, how do you go from git commit or git tag GPG signed to an IPFS entity? Um, there's so the IPFS does have a way of storing signatures um, to sort of deal with mutable data, like what's the latest release. Um, and I ultimately would hope to use that, but for the time being, that's just out of band information that we trust the person to put the stuff in Nix uh, packages is going to dereference those stuffs correctly. Um, so no worse than today and future work I'm excited about too. 
Okay, I did see, hopefully this is a little clearer. They said something like being able to use arbitrary hash types now. That was the one that needed to um, get some clarification. Does that help at all? If not, oh, I can just continue. Oh, I think, oh, so the idea is not that there's something called a whitelisted hash type, but we're whitelisting the hash types. Um, well, they've always been a, well, actually a whitelist in Nix. I mean, in, the, in, the, in um, that there's like a hash type enum and you have to pick something within there. Um, I guess over time we can just support more and more. And I think that's generally good for trying to interrupt with as many other groups of people as possible. Um, but, you know, we should be mindful of, you know, not overly relying on SHA-1 and other ones, which are no longer terribly secure. Um, <laughs> you have that absolutely right. Um, not secure at all, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, I, so I, I, if I may, I, I have raised some ire by saying we should continue using Git hashes for the time being, despite the SHA-1. But um, I, uh, I think Git's SHA-256 stuff is around the corner. And so given the other people using SHA-1, we can practice interop with them today and practice crypto agility all switching away from sha one together tomorrow um right right that sounds like a logical um course of action so another question is would ipfs give quicker substitutes than usual https on hydra or similar um honestly amazon's a big company and so if it really depends on the load um in, in in the short term, I don't know, probably not. But if you imagine a super popular Nix and we're not just wanting to shove out more and more money via the foundation for um for for S3 or whatever, the the CDN aspects of IPFS could really flip that. So um yeah, oh, it, yeah. It's, it's a type of you know, you you if you really believe in the premise and you're not just focused on the benefits today, I think there will be an inflection point and it will save resources in the long term. Right. And I think, so a follow up from the question, it says, if you're only storing git tree slash blobs, you know that one? Uh, um, okay. Yeah, so as a follow up says, so a trusted human would need to resolve git, commish, git commit hash to git tree hash? Uh, yeah, um, just as a trusted human needs to write down that SHA-256 today. Um, yeah, I'm. I, yeah, that, that's just the same, same mediocre situation. Um, but but again, you know, if if we, like, uh, so if we do all this, it's actually a small step to say derivations can produce arbitrary IPLD data and not just files. Um, mm -hmm. Really, the, I, the core idea of the Nix is that we're sandboxing the build step, not that. Um, it needs to consume and produce files. Um, so it'd be actually cool if we did download all the history and then we had a, you know, trustless way to traverse the Merkle tree um, as as exists mathematically. And then we could really write down the, the thing people actually know about and not have this human writing stuff in Nix packages trust them step anymore. Yep, and I think to be honest, I'm not sure where the schedule is because we had to change durations. So I think we'll just do one more question. Sure. So this is from Hyperfect. They said, as far as I know, currently the NixOS Foundation maintains a mirror of tarballs used in builds. Are there any plans to have fetchers in Nix packages that can fetch from a normal source by default and fall back to IPFS for, for a chance at long-term reproducibility? Um, yes, that's exactly what I want because IPFS is just a substitute or you already get that. Um, Nix will in general prefer substitutors to building the derivation. Um, and that includes fixed output derivation. So that's exactly the plan. Um, also, I might add the tarballs.nixos.org um, type of situation. Um, that That's we we had sort of we could make a hash mirror store based on that hash mirror concept where even without IPFS, we just look up the um, constant address rather than a store path. And then this allows you to use that same information, even if you're not using slash nix slash store, which um, you cannot do cross stored or substitution today um, as easily. 
great, great. So I believe you're out of time. So let's get to the thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I really, really enjoyed your talk. Your Q and A session was quite fun, and you um also <laughs> handled those questions as they came in basically live really, really well. well and I'd also you. like to thank you um personally for all the work you do inside Nix packages. A lot of what you do just goes right into there. <laughs> so well, that's really so cool for all the peace um yeah it's it's certainly you know good to be here and uh, honestly i i feel like i sort of i i rely so much on people that do the real day-to-day -day maintenance of nix packages which i don't so um you know it, we all depend on each other um <laughs> right right you have that exactly perfect yeah thanks